Well, good afternoon and welcome to this webinar uh, brought to you by, by NQA. Uh, my name is Richard Walsh and I'm um, NQA's Principal Assessor for Energy and Environment. So uh, good afternoon one and all. Uh, say hello to a number of people who I recognise from the attendee list. Uh, nice to see a few people who, uh, who recognise me. Um, if you haven't uh, met me before, uh, I tend to do quite a number of, of webinars. Um, we'll try and keep it down to an hour. Um, it'll be a first if I do, because we normally end up going a little bit over, but that's just the nature of, uh, of how, how I tend how I tend to work. Um, and um, I'll run through some, some housekeeping uh, in a short while. A um, little bit about NQA. <clears throat> We're one of the UK's major certification bodies uh, and we are represented in, in a number of uh, locations around the world. We have three formal offices in Boston, in uh, just, just north of London, in uh, Dunstable and also in Shanghai in China with uh, some additional uh, resource in, in Bangalore in India. And the orange dots will show you also where we have uh, smaller offices uh, around the world. Uh, and a list of our sort of key clients, some of the big names that we work with um, on there. And, and also um, a little bit about um, what sets us apart, we believe, from, from all of the other certification bodies that are out there. So that's the, uh, that's the corporate stuff out the way that I'm... Um, contractually obliged to uh, to mention uh, so we've done that so a little bit of um, housekeeping um, before we start too far um, there's no need to frantically uh, write down everything that I'm saying um, you will get uh, anybody who is registered for the uh, assess for this um, webinar whether they've attended or not will get a copy of the slides <coughs> We also record our webinars, and if you know how to get onto YouTube and know how to use the uh, channels within YouTube, NQA have a channel. So this and all the other webinars that we run on a wide variety of subjects, health, safety, quality, information security, um, covering most of the standards that we offer, all of the recordings of the webinars are on there for you to be able to go in and listen again at your leisure. Um, so just a couple of things. Uh, we are taking questions. Now, what I tend to do with the questions, ask them whenever you feel that you've got the need or if suddenly that pops into your head and you think, I need to know a little bit more about that. Ask the question there and then. Uh, you can either use the question box or the chat box that you should see on the right hand side of the screen on the um, on all of the sort of drop down menu uh, there's two there's one for questions one for chat we can we can deal with either i don't mind um and if if i feel it's pertinent to answer them there and then at the time then uh, i will do if we've moved on and it'll mean jumping back 10 or 15 minutes then uh, there is a section a formal section at the end but to be honest i find it just as easy to, to answer the questions as we go along um I'm aiming to talk uh, for about 40 minutes, um, 45 minutes, yeah, that usually extends to about 55 minutes before we get to the very end, but we'll see how we go. Um, and, and then at the end, as I say, a chance for, for any questions or anything that you may wish to, to, to ask me. Um, so what are we, what are we going to be looking at? Um, we're going to be uh, looking at um, some new concepts, uh, a reminder of the new concepts and the structure of of the standard. The key element of this is to look at the clauses, look at the clauses of ISO 50001 uh, and look at any changes that have been made in the, the new 2018 uh, version of the standard. Probably should have checked right at the start, although the slide was up. If you're not here for ISO 50001 2018 transitions, you're in the wrong place. Uh, but feel free to stay because you might learn something anyway. Uh, so we're going to look at the clauses of the standard. We're going to look a little bit about the NQA transition process, uh, a couple of tips from me towards the end, and then finally a formal question and answer session if nobody's asked any questions up to that point. So to sort of um, 
detail that a little bit more. <clears throat> We're going to look at the key concepts of the standard, the key concepts of ISO 50001, look at some of the new terminology and some important definitions that have been introduced in, in, in the newer standards, um, go through the specific clauses, but specifically looking at the newer clauses and the requirements and and what I'd like to talk a little bit about is the evidence that we as an assessment body might expect to see. We'll have a look at the transition timelines and some notable dates. And if you're not already aware, uh, some of those have changed over the last uh, four or five months. And then, as I say, some little tips from me towards the end on maybe how to prepare for the changes and, and implications for maintaining uh, certification. <clears throat> So, um, all of the new standards, <clears throat> uh, and I include uh, ISO 9001, 14001, both the 2015 versions, the 2018 version of 45001, this standard, the 2018 version of uh, 50001, they all have an intended outcome. Uh, in fact, they have three intended outcomes. Uh, the first one is uh, relevant to the, the standard itself. So in, in the case of what we're looking at this afternoon, continual improvement in energy performance, that is the intended outcome. If we were here looking at 14,001, you would just replace the word energy with environment or quality or health and safety or whatever. So all of the standards have an intended outcome of continual improvement. And as we'll see, this standard is a little bit more formal in its requirements for that continual improvement over and above what you might see in 914 or 45,001 particularly. The other, the other intended outcomes are common to all of the standards, fulfilment of compliance obligations and achievement of, in this case, energy objectives, but again, quality, environment, health and safety, and so on. The other area that has been uh, brought into the new uh, Annex SL standards, as, as they know, the Annex SL format standards, is, 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 a, is a much greater section on how we manage change within our organisations. So uh, the new standard focuses much more on the planning process, the management of risk, and the whole point of this set format for all of these standards is to allow a much easier integration with other standards uh, and a requirement for uh, integration with our, with our business processes. And again, we'll maybe look at that a little bit later on. So just uh, in terms of uh, where the standards have come from, um, ISO 50001 2018 is the culmination of probably now 15 years of, of standard developments uh, in, in terms of energy management. But I think the real notable standard was the, uh, the first British standard, uh, 16001. That's really when I got into looking at uh, energy management standards, uh, 2009. So, uh, it was a British standard, but it also, I guess, an EN European standard, uh, 60,001, 2009. That pretty quickly, within two years, uh, developed into ISO 50001, the standard that some of you still may be certified to. Uh, and that sort of followed the track that most other standards have followed. Um, we tended to start off with a British standard that then became an international standard. 5750 became 9001. 7750 became 14001. OSAS 18001 became ISO 45001 and so on. So we, this has followed that same sort of process in terms of um, developing from a British standard into a European or international standard. Now, this is where there's been a slight change. Um, so this gives us a, a, a sort of a, a run through of the uh, development, the timeline of ISO 50001. So the original standard, the 2011 standard, surprise, surprise, was issued in 2011. Um, thinking about the, the new standard, the 2018 standard, uh, that came out as, as a couple of versions of draft standards through 2017 and into early 2018. Uh, as the final draft, the FDIS as it's known, the final draft international standard, with the actual standard itself being published, going live on the 21st of August, 2018. Now, most of the standards, in fact, all of the standards then have a three-year transition period 
to allow for um, obviously the requirements to sink in for businesses and uh, certification bodies like ourselves to get ready. Um, and, and this standard was no different. And I use the term was no different because the original transition period ended on the 20th of August, 2021. Uh, and that was when the three years were up. So uh, 21st of August, 2018, finishing at midnight on the 20th of August, 2021. And if anybody hadn't uh, transitioned or upgraded by that point, then all of the old 2011 standards would automatically expire at midnight. This has been affected by the COVID pandemic, as, as have a lot of things. And to allow uh, a little bit of extra time, the um, transition period has been extended, not quite by six months, uh, but has been extended to the 31st of January, 2022. So that gives us about an extra five and a little bit months, sort of five months and a week to, to make that transition. Um, most people I've spoken to, most people I've worked with were sticking to their original planning uh, and are almost at the point of being ready to transition or have already transitioned and of course all new standards now uh, we, we don't do any new applications for the old standard all new applications have to be to the new 2018 standard but the transition is is moving on and um, you now need to to have that uh, date in January 2022 fixed in your mind because if you haven't done anything by then you will find that um, your certificates do expire. So why do we change all these standards? We're all quite comfortable with them. We know what they mean. What do we need to do? Why do we change them? So uh, it's really to maintain a relevance to industry. Um, you know, so the original standard was produced nine years ago. Um, I think it's fair to say we've moved on quite a bit in our understanding of, uh, of energy, of environment, uh, of, of, of changes that are required. There's new technologies. Um, things like LED lighting are much more prevalent, prevalent than they were 10 years ago. Uh, so therefore, it's to maintain a relevance to industry and to organisations who are using it. It's to provide a consistent foundation for possibly up to the next 10 years, uh, possibly a little bit less than that, but standards tend to be reviewed every six years or thereabouts. Uh, sometimes they take longer. If you look at ISO, um, Nine, sorry, 14,001, that went from 2004 right the way through to 2015 uh, between updates. So, so again, we could be talking anywhere between six and 10 years that the standard will have to uh, have to be in use. Uh, and as I sort of alluded to, to reflect the increasingly complex environments and energy environments in which, in which we're organizing, which our organizations operate, should I say. Also to ensure that the standards, all of these standards, and this slide I've used in, in, in other uh, presentations, just the same for 14,001, uh, ensure that the standards reflect the needs of all potential user groups and not just those in manufacturing. I think there was always a bit of a criticism or implied criticism that the standards read very well if you were a manufacturing organisation and made sense if you were a manufacturing organisation, but if you were in the service sector, they may not seem quite as relevant so therefore now um, the language that's used is slightly less manufacturing type uh, language um, an interesting one is to focus on corporate governance um, the old standards uh, talked about senior management commitment the new standards including this standard now talk about leadership and, and obviously leadership is a much greater commitment than than, than obviously the word commitment uh, and requires uh, senior staff, senior management within any organisation to, um, it's an old warm phrase, I guess, but to walk the walk, not just talk the talk, and to demonstrate that they are providing leadership in, in the uh, scope within which the standard is, is operating, uh, and obviously in this term, um, energy management. Uh, and as I said, push from industry for easier integration. So the idea being that all of these standards would follow the, exactly the same format, the clause numbers would align, uh, and they have, almost. Uh, and we'll look into that a little bit later on. 
one of my bones of contention with the writers of ISO 50001 is that they have in a couple of areas drifted away a little bit from Annex SL. Um, I pointed that out uh, when it was uh, when these uh, standards were out for draft, um, but for some reason um, they decided not not to not to listen to my wise advice uh, and decide to plough their own furrow. And there's a couple of areas where the Annex SL format hasn't been quite followed within 50001, and we'll look at that and we'll look at what we can do about that. So that is the Annex SL format. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. You'll recognise all of those uh, clauses. There's 10 clauses within the standard. Obviously, uh, clauses 4 to 10 are the seven auditable clauses, the ones at which, uh, when we carry out certification visits, they're the clauses that we're looking at. Don't get confused with the word scope. Clause 1 is not the scope of your management system. That comes under Clause 5, Leadership. Uh, the, the scope of your system uh, relates to um, the scope of the standard and it talks about what the standard is setting out to achieve rather than talking about the defined boundaries of, of your system. Um, slight apologies, uh, I don't know why I said that. Scope comes under clause 4, not clause 5. So scope is clause 4.3. Um, so, so don't get the two confused. The word scope there is talking about the standard itself. That's just taken from the, the standard. Uh, all of these standards use the uh, what's known as the Deming cycle, Plan, Do, Check, Act, and that puts the clauses of 50001 into that Plan, Do, Check, Act uh, circle. I tend to use this slide. Um, nothing wrong with seeing things circular. I tend to like things linear. Um, so that puts the uh, the, the cl clauses four to four to ten, the seven auditable clauses, into uh, Plan Do Check Act, uh, and also then allows me to show the sub clauses within there as well. And if I've remembered, obviously you can see their scope of the system clearly comes under clause four, context of the organisation. So that's quite a useful uh, little chart. Um, always amazes me when I produce this sort of stuff. You then, you then, when, it, when you when you're looking for other things a little bit later on, uh, you find things that other people are using, and you think, yeah, that's uh, that's I wrote that, or I set that out like that. Um, I guess imitation's the, the finest form of flattery. So uh, I'm quite happy for anybody to use anything out of this uh, presentation. That's what it's there for. That's where we give you our copies of it. If you feel the need to use anything out of here feel free, I'm quite happy for you to, to do that. Uh, obviously, integration, that shows how they can all work together. And obviously, there's, there's other standards besides that as well. But those are the main four standards that uh, that, that we think about. 9001 for quality, 14 for environment, 45 for health and safety, and uh, 50,001 tucked to at the bottom in, in yellow. And they tend to be the colours that we also use. When, when the standards first came out, when energy management standards were first uh, uh, being being drafted, uh, one of the questions I very early on was was being asked by some of my 14,001 clients was, do we really need a separate energy management standard? Uh, you know, for instance, we don't have a separate waste management standard or an ISO waste management standard. We don't have a, a, an ISO uh, resource usage standard. So why do we need a, a specific energy management standard? Um, and to be fair, some, some organisations manage quite well by, by utilising 14,001 only and managing their energy aspects and impacts using that standard. Um, what 50,001 actually does, so it, it, it focuses solely on energy performance improvement. Whereas, of course, 14,001 addresses all significant environmental impacts. So if if for instance that um, energy is your organization's most significant environmental impact then perhaps 50,001 is is an appropriate standard is an appropriate standard to have in place it complements the the the, the, the 14,001 standard they, they work together in, in in tandem I have a number of clients who have both standards um, but the system itself 
is 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 known as uh, either uh, an EMS. We tend to use ENMS for for an energy management system, but a lot of my clients integrate the two. Although there's both st two standards, they just have the one um, system, uh, and it's known as uh, an environmental management standard. But it it in in certain areas it takes the uh, use of energy management to a much higher level and gives it a much higher profile within the business. A couple of terms and definitions that we see crop up. Um, again, these are, apart from the bottom one, obviously, these are you uh, common across all of the other standards. Um, and I'm just putting them in there just to uh, maybe correct a couple of uh, misconceptions that I've come across over the, over the past year or two. Uh, but also to highlight the last one. So correction uh, is action to eliminate a detected non-conformity. Corrective action, action to eliminate the cause of a detected non-conformity. And you'll probably realise by now that the term preventive action has been dropped from the standard as a clause. It was in all of the old standards, so the corrective and preventive action, it's now been dropped on the basis that if something has already happened, you can't prevent it from happening again. You can, well, you can prevent it happening again, but you can't prevent it happening the first time round because it's already happened. So we now talk about short-term corrective action and longer-term corrective action. The term preventive action, if you want to use it, tends to be reserved now for the clauses around uh, planning. So particularly clause six, where you are planning on, on energy performance improvements and clause eight, which is operational control. And the theory being that if you get that bit right, then you're doing the planning already. Uh, and if you're trying to stop something happening again, that is not preventive action, it's the corrective action. So having said that, I still see clients that talk about preventive action. And my view is if I'm honest for what it's worth, you can call things what you like. Uh, I'm not really bothered. If you want to call it preventive action, you call it preventive action, if that's the phrase that you've used. Uh, certainly not from us in NQA. You'll not find any issues if, if we still find people using that clause as of the, the name of that clause. So for the next half hour or so, we're now going to plough through the seven auditable clauses within the standard. I'm just going to pause for breath because nobody's raised, asked any questions yet. Now, I'm either uh, boring you to death and you've all nodded off, or everything I've said so far has been pretty uh, understandable. So, so that's fine. Um, don't forget, though, you can ask any questions as we're going along. And uh, as I say, nothing cropped up at the moment. So if you are new to the Annex SL standard, so if, if ISO 50001 was the only standard that you had, and you didn't have 14 or 9 or, or now 45 as well, then this, this would be a new standard, a new clause rather, uh, the context. Uh, if you've already got, say, ISO 14001 at 2015, you'll recognise this and there'll be very minimal amount of work needs to be done. So what the context is all about is determining internal and external issues that are relevant to the purpose of your organisation and that can affect your ability to achieve the intended outcome. Now, I'm not going to test you, but we talked about intended outcome earlier, and the main intended outcome mm -hmm. is the achievement of continual improvement in energy performance. So the way I tend to describe this, to put it into layman's terms, to take it out from the sort of uh, standard speak, if you like, is there are things out there and there are things inside your business that are going to help you achieve um, improving your energy performance. And there are other things that, that are going to get in the way. So under context, we need to be thinking about what are those things that are going to help you? What are those things that are going to get in the way? They then become, as we'll see shortly when we get to close six, they then become the um, risks and opportunities. So the things that are going to help you are the opportunities, and they're the things that we need to maximise and grasp and make sure that we're doing something with. The things that get in the way and might potentially stop you achieving that 
become the risks and they're the things that we have to look at mitigating and trying to make sure that we minimize the potential impact and it's as simple as that this this flow of context through to risks and opportunities now um within this standard as we'll see shortly this is one of the areas where the uh this standard has gone slightly uh off the annex sl format and we'll come on to that uh in a short while but if you go through this process some people use a pestle analysis you might have come across pestle analysis some people use uh, a swot analysis there's no right way and a wrong way so long as you can demonstrate that you've considered all of these areas uh, that, that that might have an impact um, as as a sort of uh, starter for 10 uh, those are some of the considerations that uh, that i've seen people think about uh, energy related external and internal um, obviously brexit tends to appear on everybody's uh, external key issues at the moment uh, not knowing where that's going and and if you do know where that's going please tell me um, so those are the sorts of things that we tend to see in there but ultimately it's all about providing a, a high level conceptual understanding of the way in which these important issues can positively or negatively affect the way that you as a business manage your energy responsibilities so like i said just remember the things that i've talked about in terms of things that are going to help you they become the opportunities that you need to grasp and the things that will possibly slow you down hinder you get in the way they become the risks and we need to think about mitigating their impact the second new clause if you're new to this standard is interested parties and uh, interested parties is all about who has an interest in what you're doing as a business or who has a legitimate interest should i say uh, and the standard asks you to identify who these people are or who these groups are or organizations um, think about what it is they, they want to know do they want information from you do they have a legitimate interest are they a pressure group perhaps might they have an interest in how you're operating as a business um obviously an area that we see uh, quite in the news a lot people like climate ex the climate extinction groups they're quite interested in in energy use linked to carbon uh so there's a lot of people that might have an interest in what you're doing um but we need to think about uh, who has a legitimate interest what that interest is and how are we going to address it is it a case of supplying information do we need to communicate with them is it a two-way discussion whatever we need to think about that now this is where as i say we've gone slightly astray from the annex so if you've got iso 14001 you will find that there is a clause 613 which talks about compliance obligations now the powers that be that wrote 50,001 decided they didn't need that clause they could have just lifted the clause word for word and they wouldn't even have to write anything however they've decided that legal requirements or, or any other requirement any other compliance obligations ultimately boil down to the needs or requirements from an interested party so the interested party might be the regulator for instance so therefore they in their logic they've decided that's where it needs to sit now one of the questions i get asked a lot again is do we have to run one way for 14001 and do something different for 50001 and the answer is a resounding no I'll tell you now that if you've already got a 14,001 legal register in place that has a section on energy, which it probably will have, you don't need to change anything. As far as we're concerned, we're not bothered which pigeonhole you put something in, we're more bothered about that you've got it in place. So, so long as those uh, legal requirements, those compliance obligations are documented somewhere within the system, I'm not too hung up, our assessors are not too hung up on which clause of the standard you pigeonhole it under. So don't think that you need to make any changes if you're running things uh, for 14,001 or 45,001. Um, you can choose uh, which of these compliance obligations you need to, to comply with. So for instance, you could choose to ignore somebody if you chose to. The only ones that you can't uh, choose to ignore are the legislative ones and another slight difference 
Um, ISO 14001 talks about compliance obligations. This standard uses the old terminology of legal and other requirements. So again, you can use which are, which are the term you like, it doesn't matter. And legal and other requirements is a permissible term in 14001. Quickly, I'm sure you've seen this before, just a, a quick look at who the interested parties are. Um, the usual suspects, uh, as I mentioned, that anybody that has a legitimate interest in what you do. Scope of the AMS, which is, despite what I said earlier, in clause four, uh, clause 4.3 clarifies the physical and organisational boundaries of the uh, ENMS, the, the, the Energy Management System. You can pick uh, part of the organisation. You don't have to certify the entire organisation. However, if you are certifying a part of your organisation, that part that you've chosen must include all energy types used within the business. So you couldn't say, well, we're going to certify the whole of the organisation apart from this little bit, because this uses a lot of energy and it's an energy of a type that we, we don't want to count. Uh, so we're going to draw a ring around the fact that we've got large, uh, I don't know, propane gas tanks or something. Uh, we'll just ignore those and we'll, we'll, we'll certify everything else. You can't do that. You can't use the scope to exclude an energy type. And a new requirement within the scope, within the defined scope, you must have the authority to control energy efficiency, energy use and energy consumption within that scope. So what that's meaning is that, uh, and, and this was a question that I had again asked by a number of people who had maybe uh, a small satellite office maybe in in another building that belonged to somebody else and maybe they just rented uh, two or three offices or maybe a floor of an office uh, they had no access to energy data they had no access to turning the heating up or down um, basically all they could do was switch the lights on and off uh, and switch the computers on and off things like that and people are asking me does that count as the authority to control energy efficiency energy use and energy consumption and yes it does you might struggle to get hold of the actual energy data which is another slight issue but it doesn't stop you having those areas within your scope if you wanted to count somewhere like that then 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 you can do that because at the end of the day you can switch your lights on and off you can turn your computers on and off you can turn other electrical equipment on and off so you still have that authority so um it's not been the problem as that clause that we thought it might and then finally, at clause 4.4, uh, the system itself, you've got to establish, implement, maintain, and a requirement of all of these new standards continually improve your management system to achieve its intended outcomes. And that's a fairly straightforward clause. I'm not going to read through the rest of that. Um, I'm assuming most of you already have uh, a management system in place. This is a clause, clause five, that's changed a little bit. As I said earlier, we've moved from uh, having senior management commitment into leadership. Um, and these bullet points are lifted more or less from the standard itself. It's basically senior management, senior leadership, uh, top management, call, call them whatever you like, uh, have to demonstrate, not just talk, but have to demonstrate that all of the following are happening that the system isn't being managed in isolation. So in other words, you can't use this for energy, but go off and do something completely different. It's got to be tied in with the wider strategy of the business. The energy management has to be considered when strategic business decisions are made. I see quite a number of occasions where you speak to energy managers and they'll go, if only they'd consulted me when that decision was made, I'm the last to find out. And that's where we start to, uh, to have interesting conversations with, with top managers, managing directors, whatever you want to call them, within, within businesses. Um, if, if a major um, development is being planned within the business that might involve significant amount of energy use, then you need to take that through the requirements of the system. You can't just sit in, uh, in an ivory tower somewhere as a managing director and decide, yes, we're going to do this, 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 and this make all of the decision and decisions and then as an afterthought tell the poor old energy manager who has then the job of trying to make sure that that's all captured within the system 
if we see that happening, as I have in a number of occasions, that ends up in non-conformances against this clause, leadership and commitment. So it's got to be aligned with, with business objectives. So therefore, uh, we would expect to see overall business objectives being in line with this standard. So that obviously works both ways. And therefore, the uh, continual improvement in energy performance needs to be a core business um, objective as well. Needs to be resourced. Um, clause 7.1 talks about resource, but I tend to bring it into Clause 5 leadership because actually it's the leadership that provide the resources. So it has a foot in either camp, but you'll see that I've covered it here under leadership and commitment, appropriate level of resources, receives the appropriate involvement from across the business. Again, uh, it's it's something that part that we all have to play and we expect to see uh, senior managers doing that. It's not just about, uh, it's not the energy manager's job. Uh, it's everybody's job and we'll come on to energy managers uh, in the next couple of slides. Um, obviously, we look for promotion of continual improvement, both in energy efficiency and in the management system itself. And final one, uh, we'll come on to what ENPA, ENPIs are shortly, but it's ensuring that the performance indicators appropriately represent energy performance. That's the definition of top management person or group of people who directs and controls an organization at the highest level. Now, if you remember, we talked about the possibility of certifying just a, a part of the business. If that was the case, then the top management would be the senior leadership within that business unit or within that site, not necessarily somebody that might sit 200 miles away in head office. However, Ultimately, the standard requires top management to take full accountability for the effectiveness of the management system. And over the last few years, not just in this standard, but in uh, 14,001 as well, I've ruffled the feathers of a number of chief executives by visiting sites and raising findings. But ultimately, I've raised the finding against um, a managing director who might sit 200 miles away but actually it's their decision that has impacted the site. Uh, the site themselves have found that their hands are tied and can't do what they might like to have done. Uh, and therefore, in my eyes, the, the non-conformers could rest with the managing director, as I said, that might sit 200 miles away. And I can assure you, I've had a number of interesting phone calls over the years from managing directors challenging me and saying, how dare you do that? Of course I dare it's all about establishing the root cause. Energy policy, standard requires that you have one, nothing really changed, uh, it's got to be appropriate to the organization's purpose and context, needs to set review energy objectives, has to commit to ensure the availability of information and necessary resources to achieve the objectives and targets, that's another phrase that's used, the standard now refers to targets, whereas the, 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 the new 14,001 standards talk about objectives and planning to achieve them. This standard has chosen to, refer, to keep the term target in there. There has to be commitment to satisfy applicable legal requirements, commit to continual improvement, both of the system and of energy performance, has to support the design and procurement for energy efficiency. That's a little bit about what I was talking about earlier developments, if we're buying anything as a business, we have to design our new processes, design, think about the procurement of what we're buying. For those new processes, we have to consider uh, energy efficiency in those purchases. The policy has to be documented and available to interested parties and communicated internally within the business. Now, an interesting uh, clause, roles, responsibilities and authorities. Yes, we have to assign those and they have to be communicated within the business. This standard has now followed the requirements of all the other standards, the NXSL standards. It has dropped the formal requirement for an energy manager. The formal requirement is now for an energy management team. And that is a, a requirement. You cannot have this standard without having an energy management team in place. I have, of course, been asked the question, can you have a team of one? And my view is, no, you can't. The idea being of having a team is that it strengthens this view that energy management is a collective responsibility. And I would expect to see, as a minimum, three or four people in there, so certainly somebody who has the role of energy manager, 
possibly somebody from a senior a more senior level certainly somebody involved in production or facilities who 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 has a hands-on role in terms of energy management there needs to be this this small team uh, and that is something that as an assessment we will be asking and looking at the effectiveness of that team uh, if it's a team of one i think you're going to run into problems with with us as as assessors and again it, it identifies the key roles within there ultimately the book stops with the top management but uh, on a practical level uh, a lot of that, that work is actually done by the energy management team as you can see on the slide so clause six planning this is where we start to get into now uh, looking at picking up what we talked about in uh, context and, and starting to move that forward so so the first section within within floor six planning floor 6.1 is risks and opportunities and what that does is as i said that picks up those things that we were thinking about earlier and starts to set them down and asks us to start thinking about what we're going to do about them it's all about planning to address the issues that we highlighted in 4.1 and 4.2 that's context and interested parties and and work with them to, to make sure that we can achieve our intended outcomes and just for your reminder there they are again continual improvement determine risks and opportunities and achieve energy objectives and again it's all about preventing or reducing undesired effects and or it doesn't state it necessarily maximizing on the desired effects all of which should make sure that we achieve that continual improvement so what the standard says is that you plan actions to address the identified risks and opportunities and you think about how you're going to integrate and implement the actions uh, within your management system and ultimately when we get towards the end of the standard to evaluate the effectiveness of those actions another area where i think the standard has got slightly out of order uh, is this if you think on ISO 14001 the section on objectives comes after you've talked about your uh, aspects and impacts and you've identified what the significant aspects are this standard you could argue is putting the horse before the cart um, and and ask and thinking about objectives before you've actually started to plan to do anything so it's a little bit back to front in my mind but again I'm not bothered when things are done so long as they are done so a policy commitment one of the key policy commitments is the improvement of the system and of energy performance and and that is done through the setting of objectives and energy targets and then planning to achieve them so objectives have to be consistent with energy policy so the policy commits you to continual improvement they have to be measurable if you can uh, that's the whole idea i think that's why they've kept the term targeting uh, target seems to indicate it's more measurable you have to consider the significant energy uses and an SEU significant energy use is the um, energy version of a significant aspect significant environmental aspect now what's interesting there is it uses the term consider and what we mean by consider is you have to think about it and you have to act on it but you don't have to look at them all so for instance if you've identified eight significant energy uses we wouldn't expect to see eight objectives so you have to consider them when you're setting your objectives and take them into account but i wouldn't actually choose to leave uh, all of them out i think if you've got eight seus and your objectives referred to none of them i think we'd be having one or two things to say as an assessment body they need to be monitored communicated and documented uh, and then updated regularly and then we need to plan what we're going to do so how are we going to achieve them who's going to do what uh, when are they going to do it do we need any resources how are we going to evaluate those results what indicators are we going to use to measure process and again this keeps cropping up make sure that whatever we're planning to do is integrated into our wider business processes now we see a bit of confusion about energy review uh, what is it what does it mean what do we have to do uh, again the way i tend to describe it it's the environmental version sorry it's the energy version of the aspects and impacts evaluation so 
In 14,001, you asked to think about uh, how you have an impact on the environment and then come up with a methodology for assessing and prioritising that, putting them into some sort of order. Energy review is a numbers game and it's all about looking to see where you're using energy, analysing that use and consumption, looking at the different types of energy that you use. Are you using gas? Are you using electricity? Are you using oil? Et cetera, et cetera. Looking at past and current energy usage and then based on that analysis look to see what your significant usages are and that will purely be based on numbers so the areas that are using most energy will be the significant uh, energy users so you don't need any fancy scoring systems like you might have in 14,001 any risk uh, methodologies it's purely a case of identifying where we're using energy, how are we using it, and more importantly, how much are we using? As part of that, we also then need to determine the relevant variables. So what is it that decides how much energy we're using? So if it's production, if it's a production machine, then clearly the amount of energy is going to be decided by the amount of work coming through. If it's heating or cooling in terms of office space, it's going to be dependent upon the weather. So we need to think about what are those relevant variables we need to identify what our current energy performance is and then look at who in who within our business who are the individuals or groups of people that can influence or affect that once we've done that we determine and prioritize opportunities for improvement and finally and this is moved from the old standard to the new standard uh, estimate future energy use and our future energy consumption. So try and try to plan where we think our energy usage may be going. That used to be in the management review in the old standard. It's now been moved into the energy review. If I'm honest, if I see it in the management review, I'm not too worried. Again, I'm more important that you do it somewhere, but strictly speaking now, it sits within the energy review. It needs to be defined and updated just in the same way that you would update your aspects register in 14,001 if things changes, if you change your facilities, if you change your equipment, if you get new processes in place. Um, but one thing that you have to have documented is the method and criteria used to develop the energy review. We would need to see a document, a procedure or a flowchart of some or something that shows how the uh, energy review is conducted. An area that causes a little bit of confusion is energy performance indicators and the standard requires that they are appropriate for measuring and monitoring energy performance. Now, one of the things that I stress to everybody is, and it was on the, one of the previous slides, for every significant energy use, you have to think about what the key variables are. And the key variables tend to form the basis of the performance indicator. So, for instance, if you are measuring energy performance, and, and energy performance is not the absolute amount of energy, it's, it's a, a normalised, if you like, figure, which takes into account the amount of energy versus the, um, well, what's the word, the um, key variable. Just had a momentary blank there. So it's the it's the amount of energy used versus the key variable. So for instance, you might on a manufacturing uh, facility decide that it's energy used versus number of widgets produced. In an office, you might have uh, energy per square meter. You might have energy per full time employee. You might have energy versus uh, the temperature. And there's a number of fairly scientific ways, which I'm not going to go into today, uh, that look at that, uh, the term degree days, if you want to know how those work, uh, Google degree days, uh, and that will show you. But there's various ways, but getting the performance indicators right is key to making sure that you can demonstrate continual improvement. Now, where this standard also differs from 14,001 is the setting of an energy baseline. Uh, I'll just give you a quick word of warning. We are going to run over by at least 15 minutes. Uh, it's 10 to 3 now, and we're only about two-thirds of the way through the presentation. So we will be running over. 
if if nobody's asked any questions yet, so I'm guessing that I'm uh, I'm, I'm doing all right. Uh, if you want to start thinking about any questions, feel free to start asking. Uh, if anybody does need to leave uh, early, you can come back, as I say, and and, and watch it again on on YouTube. So uh, I'm just going to plow on regardless. Uh, everybody's still with us at the moment. Well done for that. Uh, so we have to establish a baseline. Um, taking into account a suitable period of time. Now, what we mean by suitable period of time is something that can capture all of the different variables. So for most people, the baseline is a full year. Uh, it can be a calendar year, it can be a financial year, it can be a business year, it can be, uh, I work with a number of universities, they use an academic year, they use 1st of August to 31st of July. It doesn't really matter so long as it takes in all of the different variables so because of weather and because of uh, changes in in, in um, I guess marketing and selling and people buying things uh, a 12 month period is the normal uh, baseline so a little tip I also ask people to think about and, and I have fallen I have had clients who've fallen foul of this if you're starting out from scratch and setting a baseline you also have to be able to demonstrate continual improvement from the baseline point of view. So we're now sat in October 2020. If your baseline was 2019, that wouldn't allow for another full comparison year. So what I always ask uh, in order to be able to demonstrate an effective baseline is that as a minimum, there needs to be one full year for data analysis between the current year and the baseline and that's a very important point to to for me to push home so allow one full year between the baseline and the current point we're at so at the moment if we were working on calendar years i wouldn't be accepting a baseline that was any later than 2018 uh, if we were taking a full calendar year so with 2018 as a baseline you've then got the whole of 2019 to demonstrate uh performance but we're not all the way through 2020 yet uh, not that 2020 has been a particularly good year. Right, uh, I was just looking. Somebody had just uh, made a little point. There we go. A couple of questions. Um, what are some of the ways top management can demonstrate uh, mm -hmm. commitment? Um, a, being on the energy uh, or having a representative on the energy team. That's 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 a, a good one for a start. Um, I tend, as, as part of the audits, we always have a chat with uh, with top management, but basically playing their part, not not just saying, well, there's, you're the energy manager, Christopher, in your case, um, get on with it and just tell me how you're getting on. Sort of having an interested role to play, taking part. Uh, as I say, being on the energy management team is, is a very, very good way. But also, as I said, making sure that if they're taking decisions at a senior management level, that those decisions are actually put through the requirements of the uh, system, that they're not just going off doing doing things and then expecting you to play catch up. Mm -hmm. So that to me is the key for a senior management uh, leadership, that they use the system and they encourage you, if you're the energy manager, to, to be involved in those decisions and that you're not just an afterthought. Uh, the other question, how to manage energy consumption per unit of product for an FMCG company with numerous product variants? If I'm honest, that's too big a question to get into this afternoon. I could do a whole uh, presentation on numerous product variants. There is nothing to stop you having um, weighting factors that would allow you to, to take those different uh, variants into account. It's quite often how construction companies work. I work with a number of construction companies. They have different weighting uh, weightings dependent on the energy intensity of the work they're doing. So in other words, if a construction company needs a lot of groundwork doing, that tends to be more energy if um, intensive than maybe working on an existing concrete base and just erecting steel work. So I would look at uh, ways of having um, slightly more individual um, performance indicators with some weightings dependent on different types of uh, product weight and formula of, of product. That's how I do it, but um, as I say, much more uh, information there than, than we would be able to, to cover. So we've got the baseline. Uh, the baseline, interestingly, needs to be 
moved. I was I was used to think baselines were fixed point in time. No, they're not. So a baseline needs to be amended if things change. So if the performance indicators no longer reflect the organization's energy performance, so if things have changed dramatically, if there's been major changes to the static factors. Now, what we mean by static factors, that's the converse, if you like, to the uh, variables. So if we're thinking about manufacturing, the static factors are the machinery that you've got that produces the work, the variables are how much work actually comes through. So if the static factors change, if you were to um, put a whole load of new machinery in, a new line that, that's changed how things are done, maybe more energy efficient ovens or whatever, for heat treatment or for, uh, for coatings, then you would need to go back and revisit the baseline and, and, and if necessary, produce a new uh, baseline. Or you can decide to review your baseline at a predetermined method, so you might review it every three or four years, but it's for you to decide. Uh, planning for the collection of energy data. This I said that the new standards had much more planning involved. Yes, they do, and this does exactly the same. So clause nine is all about how we're going to collect data. What we have to think about here is, can we put together a, a plan? And the whole standard is much more proactive, and planning to do something is much more evident. So we don't just launch straight into clause nine, which is uh, data collection. We, at this point, we think about what data do we need to collect? How are we going to collect it? Do we need to think about different types of meters? Do we need to look at submetering? Do we have the relevant information at our fingertips to be able to, to judge how we're doing? Or do we need to plan to uh, increase our uh, ability to, to collect data? We need to think about that. We need to think about the relevant variables. We need to think about uh, the energy consumption related to us as uh, significant energy users, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You can see what's on the slide, um, but it's basically planning to make sure that we have the right data uh, collection in place. I'm going to whiz through this next clause very quickly because really nothing's changed from the 2011 clauses. Uh, competency is all about us determining what competencies people need in order to do particular jobs related to energy. Uh, so making sure that they uh, have the competency that we then set. Uh, so that's really just a slight change. The, the emphasis has gone away from training into competency, and competency, of course, can include training, but it can also include experience. But the important bit at the bottom, we need to think about competency records being maintained. Alan, I might answer that question. Uh, on a one-to-one -one basis, uh, again, it's it's a little bit of a, a um, involved question. Um, it's a question I've got from a, from a client, so I might answer that question on 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 the one-to-one -one basis. Be the base is is really around. This is a very difficult year, and and I was going to sort of cover that at some point uh, if anybody asked. I'm suggesting that certainly for 2020. It, it's almost written off as, as an untypical year. Uh, and if there is a sudden dip or even spike in your energy performance, I would, if you're thinking of the trend, I would discount this year from the trend analysis because this year is completely unforeseen. Uh, whether next year is going to be the same, I've absolutely no idea. But uh, I wouldn't allow this year to, to spoil the trend because you could think, great, we've used a lot less energy this year, let's grab all of that um, benefit, but then you're going to be in trouble next year because if we're back to some degree of normality, you'll find your energy use has gone back up. So I'm suggesting that people almost put brackets around this year and say, there's the figures, however, we've discounted them for a trend uh, purpose. Uh, awareness and communication. Again, uh, very similar to the existing 2011 clause. People need to be aware of what they're doing. People need to be aware of the, the policy and the commitments. People need to know how the work they do impacts on energy performance and how they can benefit. Communication, uh, again, there needs to be a process to, on what you're going to communicate, how you're going to communicate. If it's external communication, it will relate back to the needs of interested parties. Internally, the bit I want to draw your attention to 
is the, the bit about uh, enabling input and feedback on improvements. It is a requirement that there is a formal feedback loop somewhere within the business where people, employees, staff, visitors, contractors can suggest improvements on energy performance. That needs to be there and we will audit that. Documented information. Um, the old standards talked about uh, documents and records. Everything in the new standard is documented information. The next slide I'm going to show you, people tell me, is the most useful slide uh, on any presentation I've ever done. Um, I'm bigging it up now, so I'm hoping that uh, I don't, uh, it doesn't disappoint. But um, it's all about documentation, and the standard says you have to have sufficient documentation, basically, to remain in control. It's entirely up to you what level of documentation you have with the following exceptions. And it's about documentation required by the standards. So that's the third of the orange bullet points. Sad that I am, I've been through the entire standard and have put in that table everything or every clause, every sentence where the standard states documented information must be retained. Having said that we don't talk about documents and records, I've used that because I think we understand what we mean by documents and records. We understand the, the terminology, if you like. But those are the, however many there are, 20-odd uh, uh, areas within the standard where you must have documented information. And if you can tick all of those boxes within your energy management system, you won't go far wrong. There is a bit of a safety net at the bottom that anything else that you feel that you need, but forget the plus bit at the bottom, everything in there, if you can tick all of those boxes, you won't be a million miles away. And I think that's the way we tend to uh, to look at this. Right, uh, moving on, moving on. We're three o'clock now, so uh, we're into overtime, uh, extra time if you like, injury time. Uh, we'll, we'll see how we go. If people need to start dropping out, I've no problem. Um, I understand that it's... Uh, um, you might need to do that. However, uh, operational planning and control, uh, this is all about now putting into place the things we talked about at clause six, which was planning to take action. This is making sure that we've got things in place. I'll get through this pretty quickly because it's all about making sure that we are in full control of particularly the significant energy uh, uses. So if we've decided that maybe a, uh, a heat treatment oven or a, a, a paint drying oven is a significant energy use, how do we control it? Who's involved? What instructions have they got? Do they know that if they're putting this particular product through, they set it at this level? If they put in that particular product through, it's set at that level. How's it managed? How's it monitored? How's it maintained? And it's making sure that there are specific criteria in place that if that criteria was missing, it could cause, if you like, wastage of energy. And making sure that those controls are uh, communicated and people are aware of them. And we need to make sure that we've got processes in place, talking about uh, operating, maintaining facilities. Uh, if we need to change anything, how do we change it? How do we review the consequences of unintended changes? If something goes wrong, how do we evaluate that? but particularly making sure that our significant energy uses are adequately controlled. Design uh, and the next slide procurement often go hand in hand. I alluded to this earlier. It's about making sure that where we're designing things, where we're buying things, we take energy uh, considerations uh, into account. And we need to think about that if what we're doing can have a significant impact on energy performance. And there is a requirement under procurement that we need to inform suppliers that energy performance is one of the criteria that we will use to evaluate their uh, products or their services. And in answer to the question, how do senior managers, how do leaders go about demonstrating that leadership? This is one of the key areas, making sure that these two clauses are taken into account and one of the things that i do is if i go into a client and there's a whole new process or a whole new building or something like that i will i will talk through the development of that i will look at how equipment was specified how equipment was bought and make sure that that um 
process was adhered to and that they went through the standard and as I say, it wasn't something that just went off and did something uh, without reference to the system itself. The next two clauses, again, are pretty uh, standard uh, performance evaluation. We need to monitor, measure, analyse our energy performance, and that includes how the system itself is performing. We need to think about what needs to be monitored, what methods are we going to use? So this is really picking up on, if you remember the end of clause six, which was all about uh, planning for data collection, planning for monitoring and measurement, it's putting that plan into place. Do we need to calibrate things? What criteria are we going to use? How are we going to monitor? When are we going to monitor? Who's going to analyse the results? And then make sure that we do communicate those results as to how we're doing. This clause makes me smile. It's evaluation of compliance. It's evaluating compliance with a clause that doesn't exist within the standard, uh, but it's evaluating conformity with legal and other requirements, which, if you remember, sit under um, the needs of interested parties. So it's making sure that if we've committed to do something, if the law says we have to do something, are we doing it? And making sure that we evaluate our compliance and take actions if need be doesn't have to be done in one go. It can be done in a variety of methods, uh, audits, uh, reviewing of documentation, site tours. One of the things I'm very keen on stressing that I think is the most powerful thing anybody can do, and that's walking around with your eyes open. Why are those lights on? Why is it warm in here? What's going on? Day-to-day um, -day routine monitoring. I always add, uh, suggest to all my clients that the best thing they can do is to walk around with a notepad and, and a phone because your phone's got a camera on it and, and note down things that you see uh, and, and take pictures if necessary. That's the, the best form of monitoring you can do. But who's suitable to do it? Do we need, uh, do we need uh, qualified people? Do we need competent people? Yes, they need to be competent, but at what level do we need to know uh, in terms of how are we going to measure our uh, legislative compliance. I guess it depends how high the risk is of uh, of your energy usage, uh, and if you are a, a, a large energy user, or it's a, a fairly simple process. But ultimately, again, we need to maintain records. Internal audit hasn't changed, so I'm not going to go through that. If you've got any management standard in place at all, you have to internal audit. There has to be an internal audit program, but we have to consider as part of that internal auditing. We have to consider our energy performance improvements, policy commitments, objectives and targets, and also the results of previous audits. So we need to think about as our internal audit is carrying, being carried out, not just are we, are we doing what we're supposed to be doing, but are we improving our performance as we're supposed to do. Management review, uh, again, inputs and outputs, very similar to all the other standards. The bit about uh, forecasting forward-looking energy performance has been dropped, but again, it's just the same as any other standard. It's reviewing uh, how you're getting on. It's taking, a, um, as my old director used to say years ago, the helicopter view, looking at the big picture. It's a bit like an organisation having an annual general meeting. Not day-to-day -day stuff. We're looking at the trends. We're looking to see what's gone well, what hasn't gone well, what can we do uh, to improve our overall performance. Uh, finally, uh, a little bit on uh, two areas of improvement. One is to improve the suitability, adequacy and effectiveness of the system. But then the second bit is improving on energy performance. Now, the first bit's easy. This is the non-conformity corrective action. If you find something wrong as part of an audit or a piece of legal uh, legislation compliance, you need to do something about it. You need to take a graded approach you need to make sure that the actions you're taking are appropriate to the magnitude of the effects. You need to document what you've done, document the finding, document the actions taken and the results of those actions, how effective. And there's a list of requirements, a little bit of a checklist to go through to make sure that you take that into account. The second bit, I'm not gonna go into this in too much detail because we are running out of time. I'm 10 minutes over now. Um, some of you may have come across ISO 50003, which is a management standard that applies to us, not to you. You can see the title at the top, Requirements for Bodies Providing Audit and Certification of Energy Management Systems. When that was published, um, it, it required us, 
to define or to raise if a company or a business couldn't uh, evidence continual improvement, it had to be a major nonconformance. Now, there was a lot of uh, toing and froing and a lot of discussion about was this bringing in a requirement by, by the back door because that actually wasn't in the standard. The standard didn't say uh, in, in simple phrases that you had to do that. It, didn't, it intimated it, but it wasn't a, a formal requirement. It now is. Clause 10.2 clearly states that you have to demonstrate continual improvement in energy performance. So that's in there now. You have to do it. Um, if it's not, it's a major non-conformance. Now, I've yet to raise a major non-conformance because usually we can find a way around it by looking at a different performance indicator. That's the main uh, difference. But if anybody wanted to talk in more detail about that, if you have any concerns about that, I'm going to give you my contact details at the end, and I'd rather have that discussion maybe on a one-to-one -one basis and trying to answer it now. The changes that that standard 50,001 made, which have now been put into the new standard, are about energy performance improvement, uh, the definition of major nonconformity, which includes audit evidence that energy performance wasn't improved, and this use of the phrase effective personnel, energy management system effective personnel, and they're people who actively contribute to meeting the requirements of the system. So examples of improvement, just to make sure that we're all clear. So total energy consumption decreases over time, so that's an absolute measure. Total energy consumption increases, but the measure of energy performance, the EMPI, improves. So you can use more energy legitimately, so long as you can demonstrate you're using that energy more efficiently. But um, the, the, the one annoyance that I have with the new standard, or more than one annoyance, but the main annoyance I have with the new standard is in the annex, which is the second part of the standard, which is not auditable, but gives you some additional guidance, makes it clear that the implementation of on-site generation, so uh, renewable generation, uh, wind turbines, solar PV, uh, air source, ground source, heat pumps, etc., etc., that does not, and I repeat, does not count as a performance improvement. It would in 14,001, but in this standard, a kilowatt hour of energy is a kilowatt hour of energy. And that's the disappointment that you cannot use on-site renewable generation as a performance improvement. And I think that is a huge, huge issue for the writers of this standard. Right, finally, just go through these last couple of slides pretty quickly. This is a transition process. If you went through the transition process for 14,001 or 9,001, it's exactly the same. Um, the changes to the standard are deemed significant, so it adds an extra day to uh, whenever you do the transition assessment. Like I said earlier, the certificates will expire on the 31st of January 22 if you haven't done anything about it. Three ways of seeking transition. You can either do it at a reassessment, that's how we would recommend. You can do it at a surveillance visit, or you can do it at any time. You can do it as a, as a one-off. Most people are doing it at a reassessment, um, and as I say, whenever we do that assessment, whatever number of days you have for that assessment for 50,001, it will add an extra day as a one-off as part of the transition. I've done a couple of these. Uh, we can also do a pre-assessment. We can do um, a one-off, uh, it's like a gap analysis. If you want to go through that, as I say, I've done a couple, people do find it helpful. Um, it has no bearing on the formal certification process. Uh, if you fail the gap analysis miserably, it doesn't matter. Uh, it just helps you. Uh, it doesn't count towards the assessment time, and it wouldn't be used as part of the assessment. If you want to do that, speak to me, speak to your assessor, or speak to NQA sales. Prior to the transition audit, about four to six weeks before, you would be contacted by your assessor. You need to have completed prior to the beginning of the audit. Uh, we have a gap analysis document, which I think is available on, on our website. Very useful document. Uh, you have to complete the gap analysis document yourself. To, this is sort of a self-evaluation that you've done everything. 
you need to have carried out some degree of internal audit against the new standard. Now, that can be, as a bare minimum, limited to a formal gap analysis. And then you must have carried out a management review, which again, as an absolute minimum, must be limited to the transition process and the output of the gap analysis. So those must have happened prior to the uh, transition visit. So just a little bit of a summary. Uh, I'm going to put in a last call for questions. Uh, there isn't any more at the moment. Um, last call, we've probably about two or three minutes left before we finish, because I'm going to jump in the car and drive to Newcastle uh, as soon as we've finished. Uh, I've got an evening audit uh, starting at six o'clock in Newcastle. Um, so uh, 50,001, a summary. Uh, so it now includes adoption of the Annex SL structure, as we've seen more or less. Uh, so it helps it to be compatible. Don't worry if uh, if it's at odds with uh, what you do for 14,001, that doesn't matter. It's clarified the terms used for energy review, it's clarified what's in there, and it's made sure that it's slightly easy to understand. It's talked about the normalization of performance indicators and associated basins. Uh, it uses the term ENB, uh, energy baseline, if you see that. There's a bit of clarification on the collection plan for energy data. That's now a formal requirement that you have a plan and uh, related requirements. And as I say, the text on indicators and baseline has been clarified to provide a better understanding. Thank you. Uh, good luck in the north, uh, indeed. Well, I'm in the north already, um, but not as far north as the guys in Newcastle would, would say. I, I'm going to drive from West Yorkshire up to, uh, to Newcastle for a, a railway audit uh, this, this evening uh, um, uh, at, at some uh, railway marshalling yards. So uh, take a completely fresh look at your EMS, ENMS rather. Visit our website. There's a huge amount of information on our website. I produced a gap analysis. Uh, that takes you through all I've done in a lot more detail, talks about the clauses, talks about what you need to do. Uh, there's a lot of up-to-date support material on there. Highlight the key changes as an opportunity for improvement. Uh, so anything that changes, it's a chance to reevaluate what you do and move you in the right direction. Make sure your documentation reflects the new structure. Uh, implement the new requirements on leadership, risk and context. Make sure that you're aware that as part of an assessment, uh, your assessor will want to speak to top management. Review the effectiveness of your current controls. So how are we currently controlling our energy usage? But assume that every control may have to be changed or updated or modified in some way. And then definitely carry out the gap analysis using our gap analysis form and that forms there if anybody wants to use it you don't have to be an NQA client anybody can use it thank you apologies I've gone 17 minutes over um I always think we ought to advertise these as taking an hour and a quarter rather than an hour because it always runs over to this time because there's so much to try and fit in if you have any questions uh, you can get hold of me my email address is richard.walsh that's w-a-l-s-h richard.walsh at nqa.com um you can get hold of it there's, there's, there's a telephone number on there that's not my direct number but uh, nqa will know where to get hold of me as well um you should all get copies of the presentation uh even those people who registered and and didn't attend they'll get copies as well if you think of a question after the after we finish put the you know uh, some send me an email uh, other than that uh, one last Cool. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Alan. Um, so one last call for questions. I suspect we're not going to get any. So, so thank you very much. Uh, and um, I'll look forward to seeing you or, or you seeing me or hearing from me on maybe future um, webinars. Thank you for your time. And I guess, as everybody says at the moment, keep safe out there. All right. All the best. Thank you. And a very good afternoon. Bye bye.